Hello everyone, today is Thursday, January 26, 2017. This is the week in charts. As usual, I want to thank you guys and girls for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I'm humbled by your present presence. Alright, we're going to talk about, well, as usual, the current market conditions. And I actually left this in from, I don't know, I guess November. But it uh, looks like we definitely have a new bull leg underway. We'll talk about that. Obviously, your questions on trading and your favorite stock picks. Hold off on your stock picks until we get to the charts, if you don't mind. And once we get there, for those who are new to the show, and I know we have a lot of new people here today, just ask about one stock at a time and hit return. You can ask about as many tickers as you want, but uh, just hit return after each one. And by the way, I, 9 out of 10 times, I don't know stock names, so just give me the ticker. Uh, last week, we talked about being cognizant and the importance of that and I feel like it was a good show, but it was I know I was kind of out there a little bit, but I wanted to express how emotional I am in all this and how emotional everyone else is likely to be and then why people sell stocks and for a variety of reasons and for emotional reasons and all. And I want to follow up just a little bit about that, and I want to talk a little bit about being flippant, and that was kind of like uh this week's lesson and, and me being cognizant of everything. And that'll make a little more sense in one second. Uh, I also want to talk about the fact that you won't always get a fourth chance. And sometimes when you have that profit offered to you, that gift horse, even though it's not exactly precise, and we're going to talk about how trading is not exam a game of exacts too, you have to take it sometimes. And speaking of which, trading not a game of exacts, perfectionists need not apply. And I thought it was kind of interesting. I did, uh, I've been going through all of my articles and blogs and random thoughts and whatever you want to call them and lessons. And I did stumble across one that was uh, titled exactly that, trading not, an not a game of exacts, perfectionist, perfectionist, easy for me to say, need not apply. And I thought that was um, kind of interesting. So that was in the back of my head coming into the day. And I think it's we have a couple of really good examples on that. And then the other thing is uh, I got asked about a transition versus a trend knockout in a setup that I that I mentioned in my Landry list coming into the day. So we'll talk about that in just one second. So as you can see, we've got a full play. Before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I like to say, all predictions are about the future. A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. That's uh, wearing a line from my brother, from another mother, Greg Morris. Last week we talked about being cognizant. And a good definition of that is knowledgeable of something, especially through personal experience, and also being mindful. And I think it's very important, and the example I was using, or what I was referring to by, by being cognizant, is being cognizant of your emotions. And as we said last week, people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons. And, and paraphrasing Tom McClellan's mother, Marion, who once said, some people buy stocks when they have money and some people sell stocks when they need money. And then they others use far more sophisticated methods. So you have to realize that there's a lot of emotions going on with those other people too. And when you're when you're trading sometimes, and let's say you're following your system, and your system says just trail your stop higher, but you're looking at all these profits on a position, and believe me, that's a good problem to have. But then you're thinking, you know, I could pay off a credit card, I could buy a car with that, or I could I could do something with this, or maybe I could pay off Junior's tuition for next semester with that money. And you begin to think about the money, and you begin to mentally monetize it, and that's when you get a lot of trouble. And I talk a lot about that in previous uh, shows. So one thing that I kind of touched upon last week, and I want to just emphasize real quick, and we all hear about trading journals and everything, and that's a good thing. But I would encourage you to, to do an emotional journal. And I don't want to get all mamby-pamby and fluffy on you, but... I think that if you just bought your little notebook and just start writing down how you feel, whether it's it's right into a trade, right after a trade, or during a trade, 
And like I said last week, I was cognizant of how many F-bombs I dropped, how many times I wanted to take profits, how many times I was pissed off because profits were eroding, uh, and, and a host of other emotions. And I'm not, I don't want to repeat all of last year's, last year's, last week's um, webinar, but there was a lot of that in there. And the point that I wanted to make, and I kind of just touched upon it, is begin keeping an emotional journal and be cognizant of your feelings. So that begins to help you understand yourself and then others. And I think last week, uh, or week before, I should say, when I was uh, being cognizant or extra cognizant of my emotions for the presentation, I think I, I overdid it a little bit too much and I found myself watching the screen a little too much and that created a host of, of bad behaviors. And I think that we, we suppress these behaviors, but they're still there. We still have a pulse and you still have to embrace the emotional nature that we have as human beings. And as I often preach based on Damasio and, and Scholl's uh, research, we cannot make decisions without emotions. So emotions are there and we cannot eliminate it, but we can embrace them. Now, being a little bit overly emotional two weeks ago, made me think this, okay, well, I've got to, I've got to watch what I'm doing here, even though I was, it was a bit of an experiment just to, just to see how emotional I was. So it was a very good uh, learning experience for me. But then it made me think, I, maybe I need to back off a little bit from the markets. Now, I'm guilty of watching the screen too much, but as I said, I got stuck on a few things and I was looking for some help uh, business-wise and technology-wise and such. And so I just found myself saying, well, let me just poke around the markets. And that it didn't get me into trouble, but it, it, it got my emotions a little bit higher, I think, than they should have been. Now, over the last seven days or so, I've been so slammed, I nearly didn't have any time to even look at the markets. And as I often say, busy traders make good traders. And in being so slammed, I found myself following things in a bit of a flippant manner. Like, I just didn't care. I had so many other issues and so many other problems and things going on around the house, uh, just crazy stuff. And I was so busy with all this, it's like that was trading was the least of my worries. But I was able to follow the plan and not get too emotional. Now, as I often say, you almost have to be flippant when, you, when it comes to trading. And that's about the best word I could find. And you don't want to be completely careless. And we're going to touch upon that in just a second. But you have to be a little bit flippant. And it's, it's, it's what you do. And you just do it. Now, the definition is a little raw here. It says not showing a serious or respectful attitude. You have to be serious about what you're doing, but you have to be kind of flippant in how you do it and just do it. And the example I often give is of Curtis Faith. Now, Curtis Faith is a bit of a character, and if you do a little Googling on him, you'll see that uh, the fate of Mr. Faith uh, wasn't so good, but in the way of the turtle, and and I would encourage you to read this book, as I've said many times before, and I and I refused to read these turtle books. I just didn't want to even read them for some reason. And uh, Larry McMillan says, "Oh, you got to read that one. It's really entertaining." And he t he starts talking about they got a ping pong table to keep them busy playing ping pong when there was nothing to do. And I'm like, well, that sounds kind of interesting. So I read the book, and I would encourage you to read it, but but don't focus too much on the methodology because these trend-following methodologies can have abysmal, these pure trend-following. Oh, but Dave, I thought you were a trend-follower. No, no, no. I'm a trend-follower, but if you're a pure trend-follower and you don't approach things like I do in sort of a hybrid money and position management standpoint, not that my stuff is the be-all, end-all, but if you don't approach it from a hybrid approach where you're trading for short-term gains but then sticking around for the trend, if you just go in and try to catch the trend, you're going to be wrong a lot. In fact, I think you're going to be wrong about 72% of the time from uh, mechanical testing that I've done many years ago. So three out of four times, roughly, you're going to be wrong and your drawdowns are going to be abysmal. 
But if you take a hybrid approach like I do, I think you could make those numbers look a lot better. But anyway, getting back to Mr. Faith, there's an interview that I referred to before on YouTube. And uh, the interview is, is by Wall Strip, which uh, I was actually part of Wall Strip for a brief period of time. And I, I left for, for um, certain reasons. And then, uh, and then I think the company got bought out shortly thereafter. But uh, that is a two beer story. So we'll have to Maybe we could talk about that uh, in New York if you guys uh, show up at Traders Expo. But anyway, Lindsey Campbell, who's the host, or was the host, I should say, was talking with Curtis Faith. And based on the, inter the YouTube interview, this is what I transcribed this morning. You made a bunch of money. Then you left trading. You lost everything. And Curtis said, that's one of those things. People look at me and say, how could you lose so much money? But what they didn't realize is that I would never have made that much money had if I had the attitude of, and then Campbell interrupts him and says, you weren't capable of losing at all. And he's like, yeah, okay. So the point is that he was a little flippant in following the system. He just didn't care. He didn't care whether he made money, whether he lost money, and then he eventually blew up, and the blowing up was part of the problem with the system, and, and at least that's his that's what he's saying. Now he he's got a, a bit of a a rocky past, and, and you could. So I'm not saying you want to be exactly like Mr. Faith, but I think that there's some things that you can glean from some of his wisdom. And there's a few few quotes in there that are really good, and I'll probably uh, you'll probably see them throughout. In fact, I circled one thing I'm going to put into the uh, the introduction course, and then I'll put that in a free section too, so you guys have benefit of seeing that. So you have to be a little flippant at following the actual system. Now, I've done a couple of columns on kids who I've helped to uh, – no visual? Oh, come on. Yeah, it should be. It should be a blank screen now. Let's see what's happening. Uh-oh. Yeah, you should be seeing uh, Mr. Faith. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Oh, sorry. It's, just, it's slow today. Okay. So, as I said before, I've helped a couple of people win some stock trading contests or certainly do very well in it. And these are kids. These aren't, uh, these aren't, professionals, not professionals, but these are people out there trading real money. They're, they're trading uh, these uh, fictional accounts, but the tracking is, is accurate, okay? You, you're getting actual trades, but they're hypothetical trades or however you want to look at it. They're simulated trades, I should say, not hypothetical. They're simulated. And I've helped a couple of people, and, and one kid, he went from like last in class, and last time he, he uh, checked in with him, uh, he was third in class, and he got an A, and he moved on and didn't want to discuss it any, anymore. That's fine. And then my daughter also uh, did her class. And she did very, very well because she was flippant in following the system. And, and, and even more so because I had a lot less input to this uh, gentleman I'm referring to. Uh, his name is Andrew. So Andrew just, I gave him the system one day in a few minutes. And then he went out and he just did it. And, and the system is just this. It, I said, just, you can only buy a stock that's making a new high. And he says, a teacher makes a sell. Uh, our positions every now and then, some positions, or makes us trade, I should say. I said, fine, sell your, sell any trade that's a losing trade when forced to trade, and if they're all winning trades, sell your smallest winner. And that was the entire system. Now, I don't recommend you run out and do this all the time because hitting the market just right is important, and you can get into a lot of trouble, I think. If that's all you did, there's, there's a whole lot of more things that you would have to be aware of and use like money management and such. But that's the systems that I use if somebody just wants to get into a trading contest or something. And you're either going to do incredibly well or you'll, you'll probably, I, I don't think you'll lose money, but you'll definitely beat anyone in, in it's certainly like a classroom environment where they're trying to pick stocks that they like. An example that I gave when the, when the kid first showed up here is that 
I showed him that we had GameStop in the portfolio as a short. He goes, oh, GameStop, can I buy that, GameStop? And I'm like, no, 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 because it's we're short. We want it to go down, and you guys can't short. So, But he wanted to own it because it was familiar, and it's something that he liked. But it was going down. It was going the wrong way. So the point is that you have to be a little flippant in how you do things, and you have to don't care, not care. And that's why Faith was at least initially very successful with the Turtles because he was trading these systems he didn't care whether they were up a million, down a million, or whatever. Uh, and again, these longer-term trend following systems have abysmal drawdowns, and then they make a lot of money. So provided you can survive through the abysmal drawdown, you'll make a lot of money eventually, provided you don't blow up in the, in the meantime. So the point is, you have to be flippant in what you do. So maybe flippant is a little bit too harsh now that I'm looking at this uh definition it's like you don't care well it's not that you don't care but you're you don't care about what's happening with your system you don't care about what's happening with the methodology so you try not to get too excited when you see those open profits withdrawing in fact i had some open profits withdraw i was looking at this morning it's like some i was going down a little bit in position and, and i'm like Oh, it's going down, but you know what? I'm so busy right now, I don't care. I've got a stop in place. Why am I looking at it? Why am I putting myself on this emotional roller coaster when I really don't have to, when I have to get these slides out for this show, when I have to watch the open of stocks, this was Forex, when I have to do all these other things, there's simply not enough time. So you have to be a little bit flippant and just like, not caring about following the system, not caring about about what the system is doing. Not so much. You have to follow the system, but you have to be flippant in the way you do it. I hope that makes sense because it, to me it makes a lot of sense. Like Mr. Faith, he was just flippant in his attitude on whether they made or lost a bunch of money. So be flippant at least when it comes to following your methodology. I think that's the point. I'm trying to get to, and I think it took me a little bit longer to get there than I wanted to. So don't micromanage yourself out of positions. Don't overthink things. Just follow the system. Okay, Leon says, best way to control emotions is to trade small size until you don't care when you lose a trade. Yeah, Leon, I preach that very often. And that's the best way to be flippant in following a system is that either you have no money on the line like these kids who are in these trading contests or you have such a small amount of money on the line you don't care about the money. You don't think about the money. So what? I'm up a few hundred dollars. Oh, well, you know, I, I could spend that at a weekend playing golf or putting gas in my boat or whatever, you know. So it just doesn't matter. And I often say you have to sing like you don't need the money. In fact, I've actually written extensively about that on my website. If you poke around, you can find some articles where I talk a lot about that. But, yeah, trade on a small size because here's the, here's the deal. If you're not successful trading at a small size – then you're not going to be successful trading at a bigger size. Okay? So trade at a small size until you consistently can do it, until you just you just don't care. You don't care about the money, win, lose, or draw. Don't care. Don't care about following the system. You just or flip it, and you just follow along. And once you get that down, then slowly increment the size. So you might add... Once you get those reps in, in other words, you do that over and over and over, eventually it becomes second nature. And as I've often said, a lot of times I'll, I'll make a trade or get out of a trade or place a stop or do whatever action is necessary. And it's like I find myself going to think about it, and before you know it, I did what was necessary, and this is going to sound a little strange, but it's almost like an outer body experience. It's almost like my hand moves, it touches the mouse, it clicks the mouse, it puts the order in. 
I take the profits if it's a if it's a partial profit situation. And then afterwards, I find myself thinking, what did I do? And it's like, oh, you took partial profits. And it's like, oh, well, now it's going higher. It's like, well, so what? You have to be flippant. You have to not care. So it's going higher. Well, it could easily be going lower. And as I said last week, took partial profits, started going higher. I'm like, damn, it's going higher. I should have kept the whole position. And then it started going lower. It's like, well, damn, I should have actually the whole position. So you can't put yourself through those emotional round trips. Again, you have to be flippant and just not care, not care about the outcome. And as I often preach, and I wish I knew who, who said it first, but outcomes are noisy. In fact, uh, within this uh, turtle book, which I, I finally found, somewhere in here, uh, Curtis actually talks about outcomes being noisy. So I think he has a lot of wisdom. I don't, say, I don't suggest you should directly follow in his footstep, but I think there's a lot of good wisdom in here. And if I can find my reading glasses, let's see what he says. Oh, just throughout this book, he talks about outcomes. At one point, he says, uh, thus the outcome of a series of recent trades will cause most traders to doubt their method and decision-making process. So again, you have to be flippant. You have to not care that you lost money. Outcome bias causes people to put too much emphasis on what actually occurred rather than the quality of the decision itself. As I often say, outcomes are noisy. Again, I'm not sure who to quote on that. But you have to reward yourself or feel good about yourself based on your decision-making process and not on the outcome of the trade. Now, if you're getting stopped out 20 times in a row or 21 times in a row, as I said before, some people have, then you have to question your methodology a little bit. Either your stops are too loose or you need a little help at your stock selection. Okay. Craig says, it takes time and some effort for the frontal cortex to catch up with the amygdala. Take a walk, focus on the methodology, not the fear. Amen, Craig. Yeah, I've often talked about that amygdala, and I think last week I said the way you could tiptoe past your fears, barring a line from Robert Mara, is to not wake up that amygdala. And the way you not you don't wake up that amygdala is you count to three before you, you make some sort of emotionally charged decision. All decisions, as I preach, have emotions. But emotionally charged decisions are the ones that get you in trouble. Your amygdala is this little part of your brain, little tiny part of your brain. Actually, there's two of them. One in each, uh, is it lobe? Side, hemisphere, I guess. Semisphere? I forget the exact terminology. But it's part of your limbic system. And it's that flight or fight mechanism that I often write about, which is very crucial for your life in both caveman times when faced with the saber-toothed tiger. And then in more recent times, when you touch a hot stove or a cab driver is getting ready to run you over, there's not a whole lot of time to contemplate your navel. But in everyday life, it doesn't really help you a lot, especially in trading. Sometimes you have to stop for a minute and make sure you're doing the right thing and not doing something that's emotionally charged. And I think last week I said the next time you want to say you want to have a, a quick flip it type of uh, <laughs> answer towards your wife, stop, count to three, and then a lot of times, mentally at least, a lot of times you're going to realize, you'll rethink whether or not you wanted to say what you wanted to say. Uh, Google, as I've said before, and I read in one of these behavior finance books, I forget which one it was, but talked about that Google with Gmail once this put in a feature where after you send an email, you had so long to retract it. It wasn't long. It was just a matter of maybe 30 seconds or something like that, if that long. And it was such a success, they actually removed the feature. It was like 78% of all emails got retracted. So that's another thing, that another example, I should say, of that emotionally charged decision being made. And if you're given just a little time to think about it, then your life gets a lot better. So like Craig says, go for a walk, get some exercise, spend some time with some loved ones, do some do some work outside of trading, and do something to keep you busy. As long as you're following your system, and as long as it's not anything to do, let's say your stops are in place or your orders are in, well, watching the screen is not going to help. Now, I'm going to show you a few discretionary things in just one second where not watching a screen, but maybe having an alarm set or maybe knowing going in 
to the next trading day or during the trading day that you will have to take a little action, okay? Those, that's okay as long as you don't find yourself watching that screen all day. Okay, let's see what they're saying here. Howard says, only trade with understanding of the risk of ruin, then you will not be flippant in your trading. Yeah, you, you definitely have, and that's the problem with the, you know, read, again, read the turtle, read this particular turtle book, and again, I haven't read the, the others, and I guess I will have to one day, just so I've, I've got them all down, um, just in case there's anything good in there, but um, don't, don't run out and try to trade a longer-term trend-following breakout system because of the drawdowns in accuracy or, or, or super low accuracy, okay? I mean, I'm okay with something that's right 50% of the time as long as you make a lot of money longer term. But when you start getting down to only right about 25% of the time, for me, psychologically, that's pretty tough to do. Now, I don't want to take anything away from these type of people who, who trade these systems. And there's somebody that somebody pointed out a while back, I forget his name, but there's somebody out there running a fund that has these abysmal drawdowns, but somehow always recovers. The only thing scares me about that is it seems like sooner or later it's not going to work. And then from a business standpoint, if you're running money, it's very hard to keep money during abysmal, abysmal drawdowns. Now, there's some value players out there. I'm not sure why they're given such a pass and their clients stay with them, I guess, because of their their super long-term reputation. But that's a, that's a story for another uh, presentation. Yeah, Craig says take a walk. Absolutely. Focus on the methodology, not the fear. Okay. Steve says, from your own preachings over the years, stress over position before you enter, not afterwards. Yeah, obsess before you get into a position, not afterwards. Make sure you are picking the best of the best stocks. And like I said, I do that when... As uh, it's been said many times before, stress is at its highest when information is uncertain or changing. Well, when the market's closed, information is not changing and information is not uncertain, okay? You know what that stock did everything, every day in the past, for the past weeks, months, and if it's a established issue, then years, okay? So you have all that information. Nothing is changing. Now, as soon as the market opens, information begins to change. But if you obsess before and have that plan in place, then all you have to do, and you just have to not give a flip, okay? You have to be, well, be flippant, okay? Be a flip. Is that what that means? And follow the plan. After is, after is just following a plan, should be no stress after initial position is taken. Ha ha! <laughs> Yeah, well, that was the whole point of last week's presentation is that you're going to have stress afterwards or during a trade or whatever. During a trade, you will have stress, and that's normal. And my whole point of last week's presentation is to embrace that. But like over the past seven days or so when I just was so crazy busy, I could care less about trading. It's like, you know what, I'm just going to let the chips fall where they may. As long as I'm doing the right thing, as long as I – took the positions that I want to take, as long as I put stops on those positions, as long as I'm taking profits. It's like I didn't give myself time to go through this emotional roller coaster. So I think that's the point of this week's presentation is be a little flippant and then just let the chips fall when they're made. Okay. When stops are in, there's nothing left to do. That's right. That's right. Because you – Looking, the more observations you make, the more likely you're going to put yourself into a state of regret, as I often preach, because positions seem to only move in your favor only a part, of, a very small part of the time. And um, I'm going to have to do some presentations on this where I need to make a, like a little green red graph on the actual charts. And you'll be surprised how long you either stay in the red or you're giving up profits in trading. And that's a hard part to do is to watch those profits evaporate evaporate because, again, not to beat the dead horse, but because you mentally monetize those profits. 
Okay, uh, which turtle book did you recommend to read? The only one that I have read, and again, that was based on uh, a recommendation of Larry McMillan, was uh, The Way, I think it's just Way, Way of the Turtle by Curtis Faith. And um, I noticed Mr. Faith ha has, a, has more of a psychology book out there, so I went ahead and ordered that one too, and I'll let you know um, after I read it, once I get in after I read if it's if it's worth read. But uh Again, this thing's got some dog ears and some underlines in it. I'm not really worried about or not really interested in their system because breakout systems haven't really worked that well. Uh, long, 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 long term, they, they, they will work because markets will trend longer term. But over the short to intermediate term, and that could be a year or two, they can work uh, fail quite miserably. Okay. But, yeah, so it's way of the turtle. Donald says, in regards to being flippant about your trading, if you have sufficient confidence in your trading methodology and are knowledgeable and comfortable with its characteristics, you'll be less likely you'll be less likely to be rattled by temporary setbacks because you know that it's in the long run the methodology does make money. Yeah, I mean that's that's it's like when you go in, into these drawdowns, you don't you don't you don't care. You're kind of flippant about the drawdowns like Mr. Faith was, at least in the early turtle trading, when he was making a lot of money. And the other people who were making less than him on a team were worried about the drawdowns and were stressing out over it. And he just, like, it, his attitude allowed him to just not care. Listen to some dumbass. Phil says, listen to some dumbass talk about honeydews. Yeah. <laughs> in the trading service, I'm often... Um, Talking, it's like over the weekend. Say, look, I got a lot of honeydews stacking up this weekend, so I'm gonna sneak in my office and and get some work done because I need the rest, you know. Uh, but uh, so feel free to email me. And a lot of my international clients are, Dave, what's a honeydew? And so last weekend I was up on a roof and I, I told my wife, she could, I said, take a picture of me. She goes, why? I said, well, my international clients, some of them don't understand what a honeydew is, and here's a honeydew. I was up on the roof cleaning mold off. Uh, Anyway, that's another story. So I got an email that says, um, Hi, Dave. A question regarding the beep setup. What makes it a short candidate? So I had a setup as a possible short candidate, and he was asking, I could easily look at it as a TKO long setup, trying to understand what in the chart makes the short versus a long. And that's Harry, who's uh, often in these presentations. All right, let's take a look at that for um, for Harry. Um, as I often say, first of all, before we get into this, I get more questions on my emerging trend patterns or trend transitional patterns, new trend patterns versus existing trend patterns than I do on all of my other patterns combined. So, and this is... Uh, something I'm putting into the intro course where I just put a little bit about emerging trends in there because I think it's important for you, and if you're getting started in trading, if you're new to trading, it's, just, it's important to understand emerging trends, but you want to focus mostly on existing trends first. And as I often put one of those, as I often say it, often, and I put one of those slides, bleh, is that uh, Linda Rasky once said, all you need is one pattern to be successful, and I fully agree with that. And that's why... You often see me preach and teach uh, just trade persistent pullbacks with something like a TKO when you're getting started in trading or you're newer to trading, okay? And then as you gain confidence, remember earlier we said if you're not successful trading a small size, you're certainly not going to be successful trading larger size. So same thing goes for patterns. If you're not successful trading one pattern, you're not going to be successful trading 10 patterns as a general statement. So learn the existing trends first before you get into the emerging trends. Now, there are three states that can exist with a market that is, is trending, okay? So you could be in an obvious pullback. In this particular case, let's say you got a serious trend. It's pretty obvious. You can draw... You could it's pretty obvious. You could draw a big arrow, and then the stock begins to correct a little bit, okay? 
Now, I've done whole presentations on depth of pullback, width of pullback, and it's quite, it's a little bit more involved than, than what I'm showing here, but as a general statement, if a stock pulls back a little bit, and a little bit is arbitrary, but you should be able to look at it and say, okay, that's just a, a normal and sometimes healthy correction. So that's an obvious pullback. Now, if a stock, or any other market for that matter, begins to implode and a tremendous amount of that prior trend is given up and this thing is almost in a free fall, then that is an obvious transition. So getting back to the obvious pullback, obviously as, as trend traders, what we're looking to happen is we're looking to enter as that trend begins to resume and hopefully catch a resumption of the trend. If something's in an obvious transition, and if we were long, we'd probably get stopped out, right? But then we see it and say, okay, this is what we're looking for now. We're looking for that market to retrace a little bit in the other way. So your pullback is now against this new developing trend, and then hopefully get a ride down on the short side. Now, sometimes you had a bit of an inflection point, and you might see, this doesn't happen often, but you might see a setup or in the Landry list in my trading service as a potential long for a few days, and then you'll actually see it as a potential short. Now, I'm not trying to play both ends against the middle, but sometimes you have these deep pullbacks where it could either take off and resume its existing trend, or maybe pull back a little bit, or retrace a little bit, and then begin to sell off. So that's an inflection point where it can go either way. Now, this doesn't happen that often where you'll see a long one day and it's a short the next, but it can, especially if, let's say we're looking to go long and it doesn't make this move higher, it just makes a move like this, and it's like, well, wait a minute, this thing is having trouble resuming its uptrend. Maybe it's a new trend developing and we'll look to go short. Now, let's take a look at the first thrust pattern first. And then we'll take a look at uh, the example that uh, Mr. Hyrie is pointing out. With the first thrust, you want a major low to be in place. Now, a major low, at least, I would say at least a one-year low, ideally a multi-year low, at an all-time low is the best. That's why if these gold stocks roll back over and go back down to make all-time lows, I'm going to be all over them when they begin to turn back up again. Once that major low is identified, you're looking for a sharp thrust higher. Now, keep in mind, I'm not watching a stock. Oh, it's making a low. Let me just keep watching it. Let me keep watching it. Let me keep watching it. I just look at a bunch of stocks every day, and once I see the pattern has step one, step two, step three in place, then I look to take the action, okay? And then once that occurs, you're looking for a pullback. Now, this could be a minor pullback, and I don't want to go, go into too many details but you just essentially need a lower low and a lower high. In some cases, it might just be a lower high, especially if this is a wide range bar higher in here. But again, too many details to get into today. The point is that we're looking for a sharp thrust from lows, the first little signs of pullback. And the reason we're looking for just the first signs of a pullback is we're trying to catch as many people off guard as possible. And there's plenty of other information out there on these patterns, so I don't want to go into too much detail. And then obviously we're looking for an entry as that trend begins to resume. Now on the short side, same sort of thing, we're looking for a major new high. All-time highs are the best, but a 10-year high is sufficient, and a multi-year high is okay too. And then we're looking for a sharp thrust lower, and again, we're looking for the first signs of a pullback. In this case, it would be a higher high and a higher low. And then it triggers an entry when that trend or if that trend begins to resume, the new trend, I should say. So this is a trend transition. So a lot of times you have this existing trend in, in place, and then it begins to die out. And then you're looking to play that first little correction in that. You're not looking to pick a top. You're looking to play the first little correction. So let's look at the stock that was referenced by Harry. And notice that it makes a multi-year high. It's not on this chart, but I was looking at it right before the presentation. It's probably a 10-year high. And then it had a pretty sharp sell-off, okay? Now, in this sell-off, this sell-off was about 25% round numbers, okay? And also notice that this stock is now at six-week lows. So what is an uptrend? Higher highs 
in higher lows, right? Higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low. And then it consolidates a little bit in here. This is a bit of a TKO looking type of move. Now I'm going to show you the TKO in one second, but TKO should look something like this, okay? And in this particular case, you have a stock that does that does this, okay? So this is not a TKO type of move, okay? TKO kind of type of move is going to be within like a serious trend. So you got a trend, everybody's happy, and then all of a sudden, everybody's happy. Let's see if we can make a happy face here. Let's try again. You got a trend, everybody's happy, and all of a sudden you get a big knockout move, and it's enough to make some people unhappy and some eager shorts jump in, thinking that they got the top, okay, and then we squeeze them out. And I'll show you that in one second. So in this particular case, the stock drops about 25%. It's hitting six-week lows, okay? As a trend follower, you shouldn't be hitting multi-month lows or one-month-plus lows as a general statement. And then also notice that it had a gap down. That means that somebody really wanted to sell this stock. That's one of those so-called, what I call them at least, trend qualifiers, okay? Now, let's take a look at the sector of this stock. And the question is, can you guess what direction the sector is headed? Okay, and in case you didn't get that, I'll just draw it for you. It's right here. As of yesterday, or this morning, coming in today, it is at, I think, 50-year highs, highest level since 2000. Now, can you guess what direction the NASDAQ is headed? Okay. Well, there's your hint. So, the sector is in a massive uptrend. The NASDAQ is in a massive uptrend, and then the stock is not so hot. So sector up, market up, stock down, something's up, okay? But I'm not excited about rushing out and shorting this stock, even though I think something fishy is happening. I think the stock is in trouble because I'm not going to swim against the overall tide. But I throw this setup out to my peeps just in case they might be looking to, to short something, okay? Now, getting back to the TKO and, and this particular chart here, it doesn't really represent the magnitude of this move. This is a pretty serious trend, especially if you go way back here. And you can see you have this one bar here, this knockout bar, where the stock sells off fairly hard. So back here, this is actually a strong and accelerating trend. And then there's your knockout move, which is your sharp sell-off. So that's what a TKO should look like. And again, it should look like this, okay? And not like, like that. This is not a knockout. That could be a bona fide rollover. And then you enter above the high, provided that this close is not too close to that high. Otherwise, you might want to give some wiggle room. And if this bar is very wide, you put it a stop below the low. Now, I'm not going to go into too many details on the TKO because I did a video on that. And you can find that on my website under more commentaries. So let's get back to this setup in question. So this, you can see this prior trend. This is good, okay? So obviously, well, stocks at new highs, that looks pretty good. But then the stock begins to fail a little bit. And then this is bad because it starts going sideways. So now it's beginning to look like a transitional setup. Okay, notice that it kind of rolls over. And then just by drawing a line through the bars, you can see it sort of looks like an inverted cup and handle. Now, in a case like this, because the rollover was a little slow, at least initially, Indicators can help illustrate. Now, as I often preach, indicators have lag. Indicators do not indicate anything, okay? So if somebody tells you they get an indicator that, that predicts the future, you don't, uh, don't walk away. You want to run away if somebody tells you that, okay? 
indicators don't actually indicate, but they can help illustrate to what's going on. So if you think this stock is still doing really well, well, throw some bow ties in there, moving averages, and you could see that they were headed higher. And this is a 10 simple, this is a 20 exponential, this is a 30 exponential. But then look what would begin to happen, okay? These are still kind of modestly headed higher, but notice that they've gone from going higher and then they've kind of lost some steam in here. Same thing here with this 30-day longer-term moving average. These are exponential moving averages. And this is a 10-day simple. But notice the 10-day simple turns. And then as I've preached before, which I learned from my friend Greg Morris, when the close closes below an exponential moving average, that moving average will turn down, okay? And it's, uh, it's mathematics, as Greg has pointed out. It's a science. And then notice that now the moving averages are headed decisively lower, okay? And then you begin to get a cross here. You could get a bow tie setting up fairly soon. And then notice you have daylight, meaning that the highs are less than the lows of the moving average. Now, daylight in and of itself could be a very powerful thing. Notice that the highs back here, the lows back here are well above the moving averages, okay? Now, the lows here, a little bit lower than the 10-day, but that's not that big of a deal. But notice they're well below, they're well above, I should say. They're well above the 20 and they're well above the 30. And what's cool about daylight is the concept of, of daylight, and where daylight comes from is in 1995 or 96, I'm dating myself, I wrote an article, Stocks and Commodities, where I talked about a little simple breakout system where you were looking for lows to be greater than the moving average, and somebody emailed me and said, hey, Dave, I like your concept, and I call it daylight, and I've taken his term and, and have, uh, run with it. Um, have run, have ran, or ran with it. Anyway. But you can see that the lows are much greater than the moving averages. So a lot of times, just daylight in and of itself can keep you on the right side of trend because you had a lot of daylight from here all the way to here, and you still had daylight in here. But then look what happens. Now you're breaking down below the moving average on a gap, as I mentioned earlier. It's closing below the moving average, okay? And the moving averages have turned south, okay? And then, of course, you have a lot of daylight in here. So now we have... I mean, you could measure trend in and of itself just by counting the bars of daylight. That would probably be a great little indicator to, to, to build, or I should say, up. Oh, did I say indicator? That would be a great little illustrator to build, okay? So, like, I don't know how far back this goes, but 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, you know, let's say it's this 20 bars here, 30 bars here. So you've got 30 bars of daylight. So once you have so many bars of daylight, you could say, well, okay, 10 bars of daylight, the stock's at a trend. Now we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 bars of daylight to the downside. So you have to wonder if something is, is up with the stock or something down with the stock, I should say. Okay. Now, in this business, I can't promise you much, but I can promise you that you won't always get a fourth chance. And this is NTB. We'll take a look at the... I think we have. No, we don't have the open portfolio this week. Well, I have some closed trades I'll show you. Uh, we were looking for an additional profit target of 33 on this one. It almost got there. And then if you go back and watch several weeks of prior presentations, it almost got there again. One, two. And then it almost got there a few days ago. And then finally, it closed above 33. And that was our initial profit target. You won't always get a third or fourth chance. That's one thing I can guarantee. So this is where it's okay to use a little discretion in your trade. Remember, discretion is bending the rules, micromanagement. Discretion, let me give you the full definition. Discretion is bending the rules slightly to improve performance. In other words, it's using your mind, okay? Micromanagement is abandoning the rules by trying to outsmart the system, okay? So micromanagement would have said, hey, you know what? I'm up a couple of bucks in this trade or whatever the case is, right around 32. It looks a little extended. I'm just going to bail on the whole position. And then what happens is, you know, you feel pretty... 
you're a little bummed out here because it starts going up, and then then you feel pretty smart right here. Oh yeah, it's a good thing I did that. And now, oh, it's going sideways. Yep, I'm so smart. And then over here, what happens? You're bummed out. Okay. So follow the plan, but be willing to apply a little bit of discretion. Be willing to use your brain to help you with positions and help make more money. Now, as I said earlier, trading is not a game of exacts, okay? Is a top bar of a chart key reversal bar? Be careful with one bar patterns. That's one of my problems with the candle people. It's like, oh, it's a it's a dead baby abandoned uh, at the bottom of the whatever. Or um, I shouldn't say a dead baby. I guess that's morbid. Uh, it's a baby with a poopy diaper uh, being abandoned at the top of the mountain on the tree or whatever. I forget what the exact pattern is. You know, dead. What is it? Uh, a, a dead wrestler with a baby on its head. I don't know. All these little patterns. Um, yeah, you know, you could you could go back and grab whatever chart you want, and the exact type will top will have that key reversal or that baby with a poopy diaper or whatever the the, the one bar pattern may be. But ninety nine percent of the time, or maybe not ninety nine percent of the time, but quite often that pattern was just a little bit of a fake out pattern. That's the problem with the candle people that I have with the candle people, not all candle people. I mean, Greg, Greg's written books on candles, so I'm not necessarily against Greg, but in fact, even Greg and I talk about this. A lot of, a lot of candle people are like, Oh, it's a reversal pattern. When the stock's going completely sideways, it's like, well, what are you reversing? You're reversing a sideways trend. You know, I, it just makes no sense. So that's my biggest problem with the candle people is it's not always a pattern. Okay. And I think that you you could you could read too much into these patterns and end up chasing your own tail. Now there are some very similar Western patterns that shape as, as up as candle patterns, and that's okay. Okay, uh, I'm sure uh, they call a flag. What do they call a flag and candle pattern? Uh, you know, uh, three kids standing on a hill, or I don't know, it's something like that. I forget the exact name of it, but you get the idea. So a lot of the stuff is 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 very similar and and uh and there is some things that make some sense i i suppose like a um i guess like a hammer or something with long tail doji hammer whatever they call it uh, means that okay well maybe the market is is uh is probed down as low as it's going to go and now it's found some buyers but don't trade on that pattern in and of itself use that pattern as 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 a trend qualifier okay and then go from there okay um we were in a week of charts a couple of years ago, and uh, boy, I'm getting old. That was a couple of years ago. I was showing an example where a stock went down to nine bucks a share. Our stop was at nine bucks a share, and it only traded like 200 shares at that level. Not that you want to watch a screen on a micro level, but if you're nearing a stop, and let's say you set an alarm, or like in this particular case, the night before, we do that there was a better than average chance we were going to get stopped out, at least on the open. But you don't know whether or not it's going to reverse from that. So a lot of times it's okay to pull that stop. In fact, I don't carry orders overnight, FYI, uh, which brings up another story, but that, I digress. Anyway, uh, so the point is that it nicked the stop at 9, and then it went on to like 50 bucks a share afterwards or something like that. And... It never even asked below nine. It just was a couple little prints around nine. So officially, it hit the mechanical stop. Now, somebody in the week of charts said, well, why didn't you set your stop at 899 then? And it's like, holy moly. I mean, if, if I knew to a penny where a market would stop, then I would own the world. So again, the market doesn't necessarily trade in exacts. Now, here's a more recent example. This is uh, Hav. And we were along, we were along this stock, at least mechanically, right? And then notice that it came here and it stops out because it hits 204, which is less than 205, okay? So it's only one penny below the stop. Now, I'm not saying throw caution to the wind and then when the stock is down here or a stock goes down, 
drops 50%, you email me six months from now and say, Dave, what do I do? That crappy stock you recommended, okay? It's like, well, you have to have some sort of uncle point, but if you're, let the stock open, let's see what happens, okay? And then if it doesn't really get too much below the stop, it's okay to stay with the stock, okay? And then so far, it's going back up. Now, I don't want to put salt in anyone's wounds. First of all, if you don't have discipline, if you're not disciplined, then follow everything mechanically. Once you become successful and being disciplined and you know you're disciplined, then be willing to exercise a little bit of discretion. Now, discretion will cost you, okay? Let's say you gave this stock a few extra cents, an extra 10 cents or so, and it stops out 10 cents below. It hits that uncle point. You're like, ah, screw it. You know, I'm out, okay? And you have that uncle point in place, so you're not going to just sit there and throw caution to the wind. Then that's okay because longer term, you're going to catch more winners, and it's going to pay for that incremental cost. Now, if you throw a caution to the wind, you're going to lose a lot of money, and you're better off just putting a stop in place, okay? So I was looking at some recent trades and some of the discretionary calls that happened. This veil just kind of dipped below that. This was a little further than one cent below, but it wasn't too bad, and then it took off afterwards, and then notice the Havnerian. I put an R in there, didn't I? Hobnonarian, there's no R in there, as a client reminded me. Hit the stop. So mechanically, the stock has stopped out. But it's okay to give yourself a cent or two at least to see what happens. This is the veil. The stop was right around here somewhere at, at uh, 770. And you can see it just dipped right below that. It's okay to give it a little bit of wiggle rub because market doesn't trade markets don't trade in exacts so that's okay they won't always come back like this but when they do as you can see it's worthwhile to give them a little bit of run okay now a couple of announcements um, as I said last couple of weeks I'm rolling out a learning management system I think it's gonna be pretty cool um, some of the stuff might have a nominal charge, but at least you'll be able to find the information and at least you'll be given the lessons and I'll know what lessons that you have and have gone through. Uh, a lot of my time is spent doing searches on my own website and searches through my own Google, I'm sorry, my own YouTube, which is owned by Google, right? Searches through my own YouTube channel to find information to to give to people to answer questions. So. All of it's out there. It's just very unorganized. And uh, so I'm going to work to get that more and more organized. And then there's going to be a, on top of that, I think I'm going to do a short Q&A type of webinar. I'm not going to sit here and pontificate for an hour like I do every week. I'm just going to, we'll jump right into the stocks. I'm going to talk a few minutes about maybe a short lesson of the week. And then we'll hop into stocks. And that's going to be, um, there'll be a nominal charge on that because there, there is expenses in all this stuff. Um, I'm still working on a beginner's course, and I'm pretty excited about it. I just got to quit adding to it and do it. It's taken me about a year and a half to put this together, and a year and a half of hard work. Um, it's it's a, it's a lot going into it, but I think it's going to be really great. At, uh, this more, just this morning, I was thinking, I, I, I was looking through this little uh, book. This is why I keep adding to it. The more I, I come across things, the more I want to add to it. And uh, there was one really good quote by... Uh, by Curtis Faith that I have to add to it too. And it basically talks about how, I'll have to find it, but he basically talks about how trading is, uh, the, the longer you trade, the more difficult you make it. But the reality is it's really simple when you, when you get right down to it, okay? And I found the quote, and he says, it takes a lot of time and study before one realizes this is just how simple trading is. But it takes many years of failure before most traders come to grips with how hard it can be to keep things simple and not lose sight of the basics. So the beginning of the intro course, which I'm going to make free, at least the beginning segment, I talk a lot about how important it is 
to sometimes come back to the beginning. And that's why the course took so long is because I put myself into the mindset of if I had to go back to the beginning, what would I want to know? What would I go back and tell that young punk version of myself? And it's a lot of things like, like what Mr. Faith just said and how important that is. Uh, by the way, make sure that you're at least on the delayed service. Now, that can be found on my website under um, Help Me Get Started. Now, the website will be changing a little bit over the next. It's been morphing for the last few years, for those of you who have been around for a while. I'm a little slow to change, and now I've finally uh, reached a point where uh, we're beginning, the change is becoming a little bit more dramatic. But if you're watching this video a month or two from now, this may no longer be there. It'll be somewhere else and maybe even more organized. But or but right now, if you go to Let's Get Started, I think it's like number eight or nine, and you can get under delayed service. By the way, some people have signed up and said that uh, they're not getting emails from me when the service is published. I do not publish emails. I do not, do not send out emails every night. So you actually have to log in to see what's going on. So right here, number nine, just click on this right here and then you'll get the free service. Now, I will. I do limit the amount of time on that. Again, it is an expense in, in having people um, on these things. So if, if, you're, if you're, I don't want to say if you're broke, but if you can't afford the trading service but you really want to learn, just shoot me an email and say, hey, Dave, I want to continue to just follow along. If you don't mind, can you keep me on? I'll be happy to do that, at least until we get um, full, I guess. But if you've been on for like a year or two and you can't decide whether or not you like the service or not, as I often say, good traders make quick decisions, so maybe it's not for you. Um, a little tough love there. But anyway, do make sure you get on that delayed service. And shoot me an email if you have any questions. Uh, you know, a lot of times this whole or half of this show was, was based on one email, so I'll f feel free to shoot me an email if you want me to cover something here. All right, uh, let's take a look at some of these questions, and then we'll go in. Do you recommend never leaving a stop in overnight? As a general statement, Dennis, I would say yes. Um, you, uh, you might could put in an airbag overnight. Airbag stop would be like a stop that's, that's a long ways away from the market and um, shouldn't get hit on normal noise unless a bit, there's a bit of a catastrophe. And in that particular case, you probably want to be out just in case that catastrophe becomes even more of a catastrophe. Uh, but as a, general, as a general statement, no, do not carry orders overnight. And that's provided, of course, your discipline. Provided, of course, you're going to go in the next day and put those stops back in. Okay. Do you just set an alert if it's close to stop? Yes, that, that, is what, uh, that is what I do. I'm still trying to fine-tune this. I'm not always available to watch the open. Thanks, Dennis. Well, I don't want to open up the can of worms of um, of contingency orders because the problem with that is each broker is going to have different contingency orders. And then when I was trying to help somebody, it's like, well, my brokerage account doesn't have that available because I'm at a gold level and somebody else is at a double platinum level or whatever the case is. But uh, research within your brokerage, sometimes you can have like an if-then type of order. And I've had a few of my clients do very well with these type of orders. And, be, and the reason is they're able to stay with position. So let's say like um, if the stock is trading below this level and the uh, ask is also below this level, this is just one particular, uh, one possible algorithm you could have, then you know there's a real market. There's somebody willing to sell that stock at that price Then you have to um, – you just have to bail out as opposed to a generic stop that's in place uh, that might just get nicked and then have the, the, the stock continue higher. So in a case like that, that HOV, you could say, okay, if it's trading below 205 where the stop is, and let's say if the bid is below uh, 2, I'm sorry, if the ask is below 2, something like that, give it a little wiggle room. You know, I don't want you to mechanize, I don't want you to – mechanized discretion, but if you can't be in front of the screen, then maybe you could do some of these things to help keep you in uh, the positions and to automatically use discretion, okay? So, yeah, ideally you want uh, ideally you want to be able to pay attention when you need to pay attention, but nowadays with smartphones and alerts and all this other stuff, 
I think you can go about your life and only trade when you have to. And if you think about it, how much time does trading really take? Now, it takes a long time in the, in the, uh, in the studying of the charts after hours at all, okay? That takes a while. And obviously, it takes a while to get to understand markets, okay? And even longer to understand yourself. But I'm talking about the actual trading process. If you're trading a swing to intermediate ter term, easy for me to say, system like I am, you really are not placing that many orders, okay? And it's really not, it, you know, it, trading is not sitting there standing on the screen all day hoping it moves in your favor. Okay, go do something else. As one of my clients says, I'm going to go do something far more interesting. Absolutely. All right, winning candle. Uh, Phil says a winning candle pattern is a big fat ass disappearing over the horizon. All right. A pullback is a flag. A flag is a pullback. Okay, I agree. All right. Um, you guys want to start talking about individual stocks? Uh, feel free to start asking. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, let's take a look at the overall market, and then let's um, we'll drill down to some sectors. And uh, this shouldn't take too long because most areas, most excuse me, most areas are trending. Uh, Gary says uh, Fidelity has sent me about uh, 11 notification of IPOs. Never seen that so many, many so early. Um, well, with with one thing, one thing I talked about in the IPO course, which I think you have, Gary is that they're going to be a little um, self-regulating, okay? So in a year like 2008, you're not going to see a whole lot of IPOs coming out, and you're not going to get in trouble trading IPOs because these companies are going to sit on their hands and they're looking to make as much money as possible. But now the market's banging on new highs. They're going to start dumping these IPOs into the market. And if you took the course or at the least just go in and, and watch the intro to the course, uh, you'll learn a lot just from that intro. And I, I like to give out a lot of information uh, in these intro things so people could sit, get a good taste of what's, what's actually in the course. But one thing that's kind of cool in that, in that intro is that I talk about a lot of times there's, there's these different patterns and one of them is the die and die. And, a lot of times stocks will come public and they'll just flat out die. And I'm trying to think of one that I saw recently. I need to start. I had a big list. Was it Coop? Yeah. Okay. So here's a case where it's like the stock comes public and then immediately just dies. So you just leave it alone. So even though a lot of stocks will be coming publicly, as uh, Gary pointed out, coming publicly, coming public. <laughs> I had too much coffee today. Um, then by watching these patterns, such as if they just implode, don't trade them, could keep you out of a lot of trouble. So if you do, just watch this. It's like an hour video here. I strongly urge you to watch it. It's free. Come down to the IPO course right here. And this IPO bull market has been going on forever. I've been threatening to do a service in IPOs and a lot of the more uh, liquid IPOs do show up in my, my main trading service. And my fear is that as soon as I do a service, the IPO market will win. But come down to this one-hour video here. It's uh, DaveLander.com slash trade IPOs, T-R-A-D-I-P-O-S. And then watch this video here, and I talk a lot about the fact, in fact, if you just read this, uh, this copy here, that a lot of times they just come public and then die like this pot belly did, and there's no capital put into harm's way. So know that there's going to be a lot coming to the market, but a lot of times they're just going to die out, and you don't have to worry about them. And a lot of times they'll just take off, okay? Now, they eventually die out. That's okay. You might be able to get 80 90% out of them before they do. So at the least, watch this video, and this is going to get you started. I probably gave away too much stuff in there, but that's okay. All right. Let's take a look at the P's, okay? So far, so good. Now, one thing I've been preaching lately is when a market is at or near new highs, in this case, only a half percent away from all-time highs, you want to err on the side of the longer-term trend. In other words, you don't want to rush out and do a lot of shorting. You do want to be generally buying stocks. Now, when you see a little sideways movement like this, say, okay, 
Big Dave says, market's going a little sideways. Uh, yeah, I can see that. doesn't take Captain Obvious to point that out. So I'm going to be a little selective in my setups. I'm not going to rush out and do a lot of shorting. That's for sure. But I will be selective on the long side. I'm not just going to rush out and buy longs. And I'm going to keep my stops in place in my existing longs because maybe the market is just consolidating and maybe it could take off again as it did. I can't promise you the market will always take off at the consolidation, but that's the, that's the way you want to play. And by the way, often, as I often say, you'll get a little undercut first, a little fake out move. The market will have to do what? Do the obvious or unobvious manner. Looks like it's rolling over here, undercuts a range, and then goes back up. And then now we're breaking out the new highs. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ breaking out nicely in here. Again, when you're just off of all-time highs like we were a few days ago, what's that? Look at that. A third of a percent away from all-time highs. Air on the side of the longer-term trend. Okay, be selective on the short side, super-duper selective on the short side and focus mostly on the long side. So, so far, so good. A little breakout here. Uh, you know me. I like to see this market keep on keeping on before pulling back. By the way, uh, support becomes resistance, uh, or I should say resistance becomes support in this particular case. So we, we're busted out through this little resistance level or out of this consolidation. So this now becomes support. So and the reason is because people have seen this, uh, people view this as a value zone. Stocks come up, they digest their gains, and once they trade in a range, traders get used to the range, so to speak. So that becomes a bit of a value zone. Uh, the Russell today notwithstanding, doing pretty good in here, uh, came down to the bottom of its range, probed it a little bit, okay? And markets will do that. They'll test the range, test the range, and if they can't break out that range, then they go the other way, okay? So there you go. Russell making a nice run higher. So even if you're, what's the case made to be here? Let's see. So you were just a few percent off of all-time highs here. Now, if it keeps dropping below this, you know, throw some moving averages in or whatever your favorite indicator is, and if they're rolled over and you can see the prices rolled over, then by all means, it might be the end of the trend, okay? Obviously, it looked pretty ugly back here in November, okay? Uh, we got stopped out of a few back here, if memory serves. I'm sure we did. If not, if we didn't, it'd be a miracle, right? And you don't know if it's going to keep going low, so maybe it's time to get out of its way. Let those stops take you out of the market. But if a market's just consolidating, you definitely want to sit tight. And again, have a stop in place just in case. Uh, chemicals, multi-year highs in here. Energies uh, probing these multi-year highs. Not set the world on fire, but still in an uptrend, just kind of consolidating here. Kind of look like the peas look a few days ago, right? Take a look at metals and mining so far, just off of multi-year highs. So far, so good there. Uh, gold and silver notwithstanding, I would stay away from these areas for now. Uh, tobacco is hitting new highs. Banks are hitting new highs in here after a little consolidation. That's looking pretty good, especially foreign banks like the MTB that were long. Uh, drugs, not so hot, okay? So you don't want to rush out and buy a lot of drugs now. And if you do, you just want to be selective in the drugs that you do buy. Manufacturing, materials and construction, and transportation, I guess you're going to need uh, some trucks to get the bulldozers down to the wall, and then you're going to need some material constructions, uh, stocks, or some materials to build that wall, right? Hardware, break it out to all-time highs, and if you have hardware, what do I preach? you got to have software for your hardware. So far, that's breaking out, too. Take a look at the Sibbies. Bam, winning. Uh, just off of, I think, 16-year highs here. In Internet, break it out to new highs here. So the list goes on and on. A lot of areas doing pretty good in here. Financials were a little... Uh, questionable recently. You can see they began to break down on the range. What did I say earlier? If you have a range, if it breaks below it, when it takes out the top of that range, that's actually a tradable pattern. It's not one that I trade specifically, but it will test out, okay? So something to look at. Uh, what's the symbol on that one, uh, Robert Skyworks? S-K-Y-W maybe? S-K-Y-W. you got to give me the uh, symbol. Uh, Sky West. Uh, give me the symbol. I know stocks mostly by symbol. I often butcher the names. All right, yeah, let's open it up uh, to individual stock. What drives this market up? Who cares? You know, don't think too much, okay? If the market's going up, the market's going up, okay? Don't think too much. Um, let's say you don't like the present 
administration, but the market's going up. You know, you're going to sit on your hands and I'm not buying stocks because I don't like the president. Well, that's, you know, so what? It's going up. What is this? Steve wants to talk about neck. Yeah, that's one I've been watching for quite a while. It's super volatile. Something dynasty stocks or something. N-A-K. There it is. Yeah, you know, we looked at this one, I think, in the week of charts a while back. This has been on and off my Landry list for quite a while. Um, it looked pretty interesting back here. The volatility was kind of crazy. Uh, but, yeah, so far so good. Maybe on a little bit more of a pullback. But HV142, it's a little crazy, okay? So be careful uh, on that one. Uh, you know, first do no harm. You said it continued skyrocketing and now bouncing up and down around the level where it should have got in. I said it was to be... What about Skyworks? It it was said to continue skyrocketing and now begins bouncing up and down around the level where I got in. What's the symbol on that, Robert? Okay, John wants to know about Q T N A. Q T N A. Okay. Um, the problem with this stock is, notice that it broke out. That's a good thing, right? But then notice it came all the way back in below its range. So just like the little breakout below the range, is, is it, I'll actually test out. Uh, you could actually wait until the stock breaks out above its range and the shorter it goes below it. So leave that one alone. It would have to make new highs before uh, I'd look to get under that one. Yeah, Sky W, Sky West. SWKS. Yeah, um, this stock is just kind of all over the place. I, I wouldn't rush out and trade this. It's got a kind of a huge gap here, almost a little too much uh, in taking off. Um, it's just not something that I would be interested in just yet. Uh, it's a semiconductor, and you can see it has a little bit of resistance back here. Not too bad. Uh, I just think that with the overall semiconductors looking like this, okay, I think you could probably find something a little bit better than that. Okay. Uh, Steve says, uh, gap too much, SLGN. SLGN. Uh, well, not too bad. I mean, it's kind of, it, you've got a big gap up, but it's kind of accelerating higher. It kind of took off, and now it's kind of accelerating. So, yeah, but you need a little knockout move on that. So, wait for a knockout move. Donna wants to know about EMES. EMES. Um, yeah, put that on your watch list. You've got some bad memories here, but hey, you know what? If if you make 100% on a stock, who cares, right? Uh, yeah, on follow through. Now it hasn't really cleared this prior little peak in here too much, so it's gonna need it's gonna need this a little bit more follow through followed by a pullback. Absolutely, put that on your watch list. Google G O G L G O G L G O G L. Um, oh, Google. Golden Ocean Group. Uh, yeah, on a pullback. These shipping stocks are beginning to take off a little bit in here again. So uh, certainly on a pullback. Uh, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Shippers can be really volatile and choppy. But, you know, years ago I used to say, yeah, avoid the shippers. They're too choppy. But, you know, never say never. They're looking better. Rick wants to talk about UEC, which is going to be a uranium stock. Uh, I'm a bull in uranium right now. We're along CCJ, FYI. Um this stock was in my Landry list a few days ago. It's more of a watch than, than a setup. Uh, but, yeah, this one looks pretty good. Uh, it's a little all over the place, though, as these uraniums are. So a little crazy, but I hear you on that one. Um, let me show you CCJ. CCJ had a bit of an extreme gap, but I liked it nonetheless, just because, to me, it just looked like a big shakeout move and not enough time to get into too many details. But I like the fact that it had... Uh, it, it began to accelerate higher before knock it out. A little unorthodox as far as the setup, though, uh, based on my – this will be a hard uh, one to use as an explanation. John's waiting wait patiently for Kayla. Uh, it's stalling short of its prior high in here. So wait for it to break out to new highs, and then you do have some bad memories back here. Uh, so, yeah, it would have to have serious upside follow-through and then a pullback on that one. Ruby for Lewis. Are you bi? Are you bi? Uh, no, this big gap here. Don't like it. Uh, this was one we were long a while back. 
this was a good IPO if memory serves. Um, but no, too much. Uh, I did find myself going to the website and I was very confused as to what they did. TGB long for 78. I'm long that one too. <laughs> Donald, good job. TGB. Yeah, you know, on a pullback, it looks pretty good. Um, yeah, it looks good. That's the best looking stock I've ever seen. <laughs> um, it does have a little overhead supply here, which if it got to two bucks a share, I would not be complaining. Uh, but yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. Sorry, I'm getting loud. Uh, PME for Andre. PME. We'll have to go light around soon. PME. Let's see how many we can get. Uh, this move, this it's just a big one bar breakout. So for me, I'd like to see more follow through. A little bit on the thin side. Food stocks right now look like crud. There's so many better stocks out there. So I would have, I don't know. I think I'd avoid this one. It's just too, you, you got this one big uptrend here, one big up leg. I think I'd avoid that one. Uh, IPI for Donald. IPI, it's intrepid something, right? IPI. Uh, no, too many days in the pullback, okay? It makes a new high, a lot of days in the pullback. So this would actually have to break out to new highs again and then play a pullback along the way. The next pullback, I should say. SBLK, that sounds like a shipper. Uh, yeah, put that on your watch list. It needs a bit of a knockout move, though. It needs a pullback. So, yeah, absolutely put that on your watch list. Angelo wants to know about PAH. Pah. <laughs> uh, you got some problems at in the 20s, but it's in the 10s. Yeah, on a pullback, maybe. Um, it looks okay. The only problem is if it starts pulling back now, it's a little close to its prior peak, but put it on your watch list. I mean, ideally, you know, you guys want to, uh, we want to focus mostly on stocks that are actually set up. I mean, if something's trending, then by all means, put it in your watch list. ASMB, yeah, it needs a little pullback. Looks pretty good, though. Nice little breakout. Uh, really super duper thin now. So too thin to trade as a general statement. I have to dig a little further to see if it's got some volume here and there. But avoid that one because it's too thin. Andre, you love this little, uh, he loves those little bitty stocks. Uh, yeah, URA looks good. This was actually in the Landry list a few days ago uh, as an ETF for uranium. Uh, it does have some bad memories along the way, but uranium is just so crazy. It's going to be nearly impossible. Uh, maybe on a pullback, ideally I'd like to see some more upside follow through on a pullback, but yeah, it looks okay. Salt, S-A-L-T, that sounds like a shipper. Uh, yeah, bulk shipper. Uh, yeah, you know, on a pullback. Nice little IPO breakout uh, in here. Next pullback, absolutely. VIAV, too wide and loose. Steve might have answered his own question. VIAV, mm, not too wide and loose in more recent times. No, it's okay. I mean, yeah, back here is electric party grab. But sometimes personalities can change the stock, so it's not too bad, Steve. Uh, my only concern here is you just broke out from this base. And now you're already pulling back to the base, so I would prefer if it would have cleared that base more and then pulled back, okay? Uh, TGB, yes, that's that's the one. We were talking about that one. Put it on your watch list. Best stock in the world. Uh, no, this is sideways. Whoever asked about this, WTI. So what you need to do is wait for a breakout and then uh, come back. Long, some low-price semis, SQ and S. Uh, yeah, it looks kind of interesting. Uh, low and oh, no, I'd avoid that. It's just all over the place. Uh, no, electrocardiogram. EXFO, XFO. Uh, thin, 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 too thin. Too thin to trade. Yeah, I hear you. It's in a trend. It's not pulled back, though. Okay. Y'all throw me some pullbacks. We want to get some setups going into tomorrow, right? SSW, that's okay. It's pullback. Um, problem here is it just has a lot of bad memories above uh, where it's trading. So it could run into some troubles, but I hear you. It's not bad. C, S-E-A for Angelo. C, Craig, you're next. Oh, Greg, I'm sorry. Greg, then Craig, then Greg. Uh, yeah, it's an ETF, uh, shipping ETF. Yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. That might be a good way to play the uh, shipping stocks. A little on the thin side. The ETFs are okay to be a little thin. 
Okay. Now, Greg, ATW. Uh, no, it's just uh, trading sideways in here. Too much sideways movement. Frack for Jim. Uh, yeah, this is kind of interesting. Put it on your watch list as an IPO. Uh, it's above that $20 threshold that we talk about for the breakout pattern, but it might be worth making an exception based on the uh, it, the uh, current excitement of this market. One, two, three, four, five. So day six would be your uh, setup there. CVEO. Uh, yeah, on a pullback. You know, it's another case where it might pull back to the range, though. So it needs to break out more before it pulls back. Yum C, yeah, it's going to be uh, Chinese yum. Uh, no. No, I mean, unless you were trading something a little bit more, maybe a deep retrace, I see it. But no, it's just too sideways. You'd have to wait for that to make new highs. Put it on your watch list, though. CNX, uh, yeah, that one's, that one, I think, I need to check the lander list uh, before. Yeah, this was uh, one that shows up in a lander list every now and then. Uh, on a pullback, yeah, aluminium is doing uh, very well in here. AGI. Uh, Chevy next. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, gold stock, penny stock, though, super duper thin. Uh, needs a little bit more pullback, okay? But, yeah, way thin, penny stock. Careful. Francesco wants to know about NIM. That's going to be a mining company. Uh, no, it's just too wide and loose, okay, and it's too sideways. Um, with these gold stocks, I like them when they're coming off of major lows like down here. I like them more like that. Um, they were just kind of chopping around in the range, so I would avoid that. Uh, Shiva says, uh, CRNT, two years basing, made both high last May, now starting a trend, enter above 370. All right, Shiva, let's take a look at that, CRNT. Uh, talk about a bow tie last May. Well, what you want to do, I hear what you're saying. Um, it's a little on the thin side, but his point is that it made a bow tie last May. Um, I would just say, hey, it's a trend. I wouldn't go back and say it'd be bow tie way back then because that's not as relevant as its recent trend. But you can see it's kind of chopping around in here. So to be a new setup, it would have to break off the new highs and then pull back. Okay. All right, let's get to someone we haven't gotten to in a while. Jeff wants to know about Veil setting up again. Let's take a look at that. And you waited patiently for that. I appreciate that. Um, well, it could set up again. It's in a nice uptrend, so wait for the next pullback. That was the one we talked about as discretionary play. CJJY for Brett. Thanks for waiting. CJJY. CJY. CJJY. That's not coming up. Can you, uh, Brett, can you give me a new, a new symbol or another symbol? Uh, in the meantime, we'll look at um, ASIX for Howard. Sometimes I feel like I'm in romper room. I see Howard and I see Shiba. <laughs> no ladies today. Where are you ladies today? Uh, yeah, this is looking kind of interesting. you got a nice persistent breakout, a little bit more pullback. Absolutely. Put that on your watch list. It's on mine. VIAV. We're going to go to lightning round now. We're going to have to hurry up. V-I-A-V. -V. Uh, yeah, the problem is we too, um, didn't break out enough. We already talked about that one. Absolutely. Uh, needs more file through. GV, I got two people in a row asking about GV. Yeah, I'm on a pullback. Absolutely. I mean, this is one I've been watching for a while. And it looks like we're getting the beginning of that pullback today. So, yeah, put that on your watch list, absolutely. And, you know, you're noticing today not a whole lot of stocks set up, or not even one, I said, worth uh, rushing out and buying. But a lot of these stocks are trending. So now's the time to work on that momentum list. You know, make sure you got, like, GV. Let me take a look at my momentum list to see if the GV's in there. I'm sure it is. If not, it should be. GV right there, see? Okay. So a lot of the stocks we talked about today are in this momentum list, as you can see. Uh, I need to clean this up a little bit, but I got it down to about 100, which is good for me. Sometimes this thing gets two or 300 in here, but uh, it's not bad. Tesla, but bad memories. Yeah, Tesla's just a, a crappy stock. It's all over the place. Uh, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Looks pretty good now, though, right? Uh, nice little persistent uptrend, but then you back the chart out a little bit, and it's just electrocardiogram. So I think I would avoid that one for sure. Brett wants to know about Pam. So does his wife. 
I don't know what that means. Um, yeah, that's a nice trend. Uh, it's a utility. I'm not too excited about buying utilities at this point in time. But you can see it seems to be doing fairly well. It's an electric uh, utility. It's also foreign. So I would I would actually find out what they do to make them so um, to look so good. But yeah, good eye, Brett. On a pullback, that might be worthwhile. Okay. Okay. Let's see if we could just squeeze in one or two more. We're gonna have to wrap things up here because of the software. CF. CF. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, these uh, chemicals are doing pretty good in here. Yeah, that looks okay. Maybe a little bit more of a pullback, uh, a little bit more knockout move. But, yeah, I hear you on that. Not bad. Okay. Salt. I think we did that. That's a shipper, right? Yeah, we did that one. Uh, put it in your watch list. Look, right there. Bam, watch list. There it is. Okay. Well, look, uh, we're out of time, so I, I better wrap things up so we don't lose the recording. But... Thank you guys so much for showing up. I appreciate you being here. We can make fun of ladies because they didn't show up this week. But uh, no, 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 I'm just kidding. Uh, anyway, everybody have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk between now. And then, uh, as you can tell, I have a blast doing these shows. So thanks for showing up. I'm humbled that you guys and uh, maybe girls next week will showed up. Uh, but anyway, uh, everybody have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk again. And then hopefully I'll see all you guys and some girls next week. Thank you so much.